Hi. In this video, we're going to look at a short introduction to transient heat transfer, uh, and in particular, we're going to look at the lumped capacitance method for analyzing it. Uh, and as an example, as a familiar household example, think of something cooking in an oven. Uh, you put a potato into an oven, the potato is at 20 degrees C initially, uh, the air in the oven is at 200 degrees C, and the air temperature in the oven is controlled, so for the sake of argument, we'll say it stays at a constant 200 degrees C, and the potato is going to get hotter as time goes by. So have a think about uh, how the temperature of the potato increases. And if we're to plot uh, temperature of the potato as a function of time, we know that it starts at 20 degrees C, so there's a point there on our curve. Uh, we know that it ends up at 200 degrees C. If, if we wait a long enough time, uh, it ends up somewhere here. But what happens in between? Pause the video, have a think about that, uh, sketch the curve. Here are some possibilities. Maybe it overshoots the final temperature. Uh, maybe it kind of overshoots and oscillates like a lightly damped system. Maybe it's asymptotic like in C. Uh, or maybe it rises linearly and then stops when it gets to 200 degrees C like in D. Well, let's have a think about these. Let's consider case A. Uh, if it gets hotter than 200 degrees C. If it gets hotter than 200 degrees C, then our potato is hotter than the air. Uh, so what will happen then is uh, if the potato gets to say 201 degrees, uh, we're going to have heat transfer from the potato to the air because the air is cooler. So if the potato gets above 200 degrees C, there is no way that it can keep rising. That is just not, uh, that's not possible. Okay, so we can uh, exclude that. Case B, for the same reason we can exclude, if it gets above 200 degrees C, there is absolutely no way it can, it can continue to get hotter. So that's impossible. Uh, case D is a bit more plausible here. It gets to 200 degrees C uh, and it just stops. But uh, what actually happens is that the heat transfer rate depends on the temperature difference between the, the temperature between the uh, difference between the potato uh, and the air. So once the, uh, as the thing starts to get warmer, uh, the temperature difference is getting smaller. We have a, initially we have a difference of 180 degrees C. Here we have a difference of maybe 150. Here we have a difference of about 80 or 100. The temperature difference is getting smaller. So the rate of heat transfer should be getting smaller. So the rate of increase of temperature should be getting smaller. So what actually happens is this. We start with a big temperature difference. We get the maximum rate of heat transfer the maximum rate of temperature rise. We get a really steep slope there on the curve. By the time we get to here, the temperature difference is now smaller. So the slope of the curve here is smaller. The temperature is rising less rapidly. And the closer you get to 200 degrees C, the smaller the temperature difference is and the smaller the heat transfer rate is. Uh, and if we ever did get to 200 degrees C, the heat transfer rate would be zero. So it's a classic asymptotic sort of a thing. The closer it gets to 200 degrees, the smaller the temperature difference, the delta T, and the smaller the heat transfer rate and the smaller the approach. So case C here uh, is, the, is, is something like what really happens. Another question for you, what kind of a function is that? If you had to guess what kind of a mathematical function that curve C is, what would you say? It's an exponential. And what we're going to do now is prove that it's an exponential subject to a few approximations. Uh, and restrictions, we're going to prove that that curve is an exponential. And of course, this isn't just about cooking. This is lots of applications. Um, any industrial process that involves heating, like heat treatments for materials or welding, um, heat transfer and cooling and reciprocating engines, cooling of spacecraft, heating and cooling of buildings over the daily cycle. They all follow this kind of behavior. Okay, so generally speaking, temperature is a function of uh, x, y, z, and t. Temperature varies throughout space and time. Uh, often we will think about steady state heat transfer and steady state temperature fields where the temperature does not depend on time. Today, though, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the full transient case where temperature varies with time. And we're going to uh, restrict that a little bit. We're going to, as I said, we're going to use this lumped capacitance method where we're restricting it further. We're saying the temperature is a function of time only. So for the example of a potato, what we're saying now is the temperature of the potato uh, at the center of the potato is exactly the same as the temperature on the skin of the potato is exactly the same as the temperature throughout the potato is exactly the same as the average temperature 
uh, of the potato. Uh, that's an approximation. Obviously, it's not generally true. If we're heating a potato in an oven, the outside gets hotter before the inside does. Uh, but this is a pretty good approximation in lots of cases. Later on, we'll come back just to examine when it's a good approximation and when it's not. But uh, for now, we're just going to develop the, the theory for that. Okay, so we write down the first law of thermodynamics over some process uh, with the potato as a system. The energy that goes in minus the energy that goes out is the increase in the energy stored in the potato. We can write that in uh, a rate form and we can be a bit more specific about what these energy transfers are. So there's no work being done here. There is no mechanical device that is moving parts of the potato around or exerting forces on the potato. There are no changes in potential energy. The potato is not moving up and down. Uh, it has no kinetic energy. So what we're left with there is that the energy transfers uh, are heat transfers only. Uh, and the uh, energy stored inside the potato is internal energy only. It is uh, strictly thermal uh, energy. Uh, and that heat transfer uh, over some period of time, if we considered one minute of the whole cooking process, we uh, would have a transfer of heat in joules, or we consider the rate of heat transfer. We consider we can consider imagine an infinitesimal period of time, and uh, we can imagine the rate of heat transfer, the heat transferred per unit time, the heat transfer rate. So let's do it in a rate form. We have our lowercase q is the heat transfer rate that has units of watts, uh, and our uh, rate of change of energy stored in the potato. The energy, the internal energy of the potato is capital U. It's a function of time. The DDT of that is the um, rate of change of that energy. That's in joules per second, which are the same things as watts. So we have a differential equation. We're on our way. Uh, we need to add a bit more detail to that, and we need to solve it. Q is the rate of heat transfer. Uh, it's convective heat transfer, so it's H A delta T, the convective heat transfer coefficient times the surface area times the temperature difference that is driving heat transfer, which is the temperature difference from the uh, ambient air at T infinity to the surface temperature of the uh, object being heated. And that is written in such a way that it's positive if the air is hotter than the uh, surface, which means uh, that's going to give us a positive Q, which is heat transfer into the system which is uh, the usual sign convention we use, positive heat transfer if heat transfer is inwards, if it's contributing energy. Okay, so the right-hand side, we have uh, we have capital U, the uh, internal energy of the system. Uh, and for an incompressible solid, the internal energy, uh, the stored thermal energy, if you like, is mass times specific heat and material property times the average temperature uh, of the object. Okay, so what we actually have on the right-hand side is du dt, uh, if we differentiate mc t bar, well, the mass and the specific heat are constants, so they come outside of the derivative and we get uh, mc dt bar dt. Now, at this point, it's worth mentioning that a potato is maybe not a great example for this because uh, there are things going on like some water is evaporating out of the potato as you cook it and it's uh, undergoing some chemical changes. So maybe its mass isn't exactly constant and its specific heat may not be exactly constant. So, uh, but let's just uh, imagine from this point forward that we're dealing with a material that is homogeneous and, and doesn't change its properties and doesn't do anything funny. So we're, we're, we're getting closer to an equation that we can actually solve. Uh, if you remember, um, we had uh, Q equals um, du dt. Uh, we've now expanded the q a little bit. We've expanded du dt. We've written them both in terms of temperature, actually. And we can uh, substitute those expressions into our equation. And this is what we get. And now we use our lumped capacitance approximation. Since we're saying that the temperature of the potato at an instant in time is the same everywhere throughout the potato, then Ts, the surface temperature, is the same as the average temperature of the potato, is the same as the temperature at any point in the potato. We're not saying the temperature of the potato is constant in time, we're saying that at an instant in time, it is the same everywhere in space. So we do that, uh, and to implement that, we just drop 
the subscript S and we drop the over bar, we're just going to call the temperature, that uniform temperature of the potato, we're just going to call it big T without any, uh, any other notation now. And I'm going to uh, sometimes, when I remember, I'm going to put brackets small t after it to remind us that that is a function of time and a function of time only. Uh, and that final equation there in the red box, uh, that is an ordinary differential equation with temperature as the dependent variable. So that's something that we can solve. It has one dependent variable, the temperature, big T. It has one independent variable, the time, small t. Uh, that's something that we should be able to solve. So we have to solve this differential equation. Uh, and there's a trick, like with a lot of these things, it's a lot easier if you know the trick before you start to do it. The trick is that we define a new variable, uh, theta. Theta is a function of time, theta of t. It's equal to uh, temperature of the potato, the time varying temperature of the potato. That should be really in brackets t as well, minus t infinity. And theta uh, shows up in our equation. Theta, this thing in brackets here is exactly minus theta. dt dt here, the derivative of temperature, uh, that is actually equal to d theta dt because when you differentiate theta, uh, you are differentiating t minus t infinity and the derivative of t infinity is zero because it's constant. So our equation, we can recast it in terms of theta instead of t and remember that theta is our time dependent variable. And what theta is, is the temperature difference between the uh, ambient air and the object that is changing its temperature. Now, we rearrange this equation a bit. This is now uh, certainly an equation that you've seen before in pure maths and, and applied maths and in various uh, applications. Uh, we separate the variables out a bit. In other words, we collect all the theta on the right-hand side. We collect all the time on the, on the left-hand side. Uh, we integrate. Uh, we get the integral of uh, d theta over theta, so it's log theta. And we're evaluating that from zero up to a general time uh, t. The integral uh, on the left is just the integral of dt, so it's just uh, t. So to do this, we need an initial condition. Uh, and when I say an initial condition, we're really just labeling something. So we're gonna, at time zero, we're going to say temperature is ti. So we're labeling the initial temperature as ti, and therefore our theta at time zero is ti minus t infinity. So we, we, uh, we can use that to firm up the equation a bit. So we evaluate our integrals then uh, between their limits. Uh, we evaluate uh, time at t is t, time at time zero is zero, that's trivial. Uh, theta at time t is the general t brackets t minus t infinity. Theta at time zero is uh, t minus t infinity at time zero is ti minus t infinity. So we've just given the initial temperature uh, a label of big ti. So we have the log of this minus the log of that. And the way that logs work, of course, that is the log of one thing divided by the other thing. So we get uh, minus ha over mc by the time is equal to the log of this ratio here. Uh, usually it's flipped around and written in a slightly different way. Usually we take the exponential of both sides, so the exponential of the log is the is, is the thing in brackets there, uh, this thing on the left-hand side, uh, and we get the exponential of all this, e to the power of all of that there. And that is a solution. So we've gone from our differential equation to a, uh, a new equation now that gives us uh, temperature as a function of time on the left hand side with some other stuff there are a few constants floating about on the left hand side there as well and on the right hand side we have a pure function of time and as you might have guessed it is uh, an exponential So let's think a little bit about what that uh, function is and how it behaves. Uh, I've written it slightly differently here. I've written t infinity minus t instead of t minus t infinity, but I've done that on the top and the bottom of the fraction. So 
if you want to just take a moment to convince yourself that, that that's correct. Uh, it makes more sense this way here because we're thinking we're, we're, we're thinking we've been thinking about an example where t infinity is hotter than t. The air is hotter than the potato, so it's kind of natural to write it. So this is a this uh, numerator is a positive number. So let's think now about the shape of this curve, this function. Uh, let's plot a few points uh, on a graph of time versus temperature t. Uh, so at time zero, when small t is zero, the right-hand side of that equation is uh, e to the minus zero, which is one. The left-hand side, uh, t infinity minus t over t infinity minus t i uh, is equal to one, means t infinity minus big T is equal to t infinity minus t i, means uh, t equals t i. So we get uh, the first point on our graph, as expected, and uh, as we actually built into the equation when we developed it. At the other extreme, uh, as time t goes to infinity, we are tending towards e to the minus infinity. Uh, e to the infinity would be infinite. So e to the minus infinity is the inverse of that. We are tending towards uh, zero. Okay, so e to the minus infinity uh, tends to zero. Uh, we have uh, t infinity minus t of time divided by t infinity minus ti is tending to zero. The bottom here, the t infinity minus ti is a constant. So t infinity minus big T is tending to zero means t is tending to t infinity. So it's a classic asymptote. Uh, the curve is going to approach that dashed line, but it's never going to reach it. Uh, then we could, you know, we could plot lots of points along the curve. We could we could put numbers on them and plot lots of points along it. There's one point in the middle there that is uh, a handy reference, uh, and that is the point where t is exactly mc over ha. Uh, mc over ha is this thing here that's in the uh, equation. So when t has exactly that value, then the right-hand side is e to the minus 1, which is a constant. It has a value of about 0 0.3679, uh, which is equal to 1 minus 0 0.6321. So uh, if we scale this whole thing, if we consider uh, the overall temperature change from ti to t infinity you know, to, to, to be to be one, then this thing here is 0 0.3679. Uh, this bit of it is 0.632 or 63%. So at that point, uh, we're saying that the temperature has changed by 63% of its eventual final change that it's that, that it will make as t goes to infinity. So that's uh, a kind of a reference, uh, and it's useful because it gives us a reference. Uh, time scale. Okay, so again, that's the 63% uh, change here. This uh, is used as a handy reference to characterize how fast or slow the whole process is, and it's called the time constant, the thermal time constant, uh, the Greek letter tau. Um, and that notion might be familiar to you if you've ever studied uh, electrical circuits with capacitance in them, this electrical time constant uh, comes up and it's, has the same idea of a 63%. And mathematically, it's exactly the same because the governing equations are exactly the same. Uh, instead of uh, energy, you have charge. Instead of heat transfer rates, you have current. But the equations are the same. So this thermal time constant is very like the electrical time constant. And finally, if we join up all the points, of course, we get our exponential curve. Uh, and the thermal time constant gives you it gives you a kind of a rule of thumb or a, a, an easy way of characterizing a process. If uh, your time constant is big, it means the thermal response is slow. It takes a long time to make sixty three percent of its uh, of its temperature response. Um, and what gives us the uh, a big time constant? Well, uh, a big mass might give us might give us a big time constant. Um, a big specific heat capacity might give us a big time constant. So in other words, we have a material where it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature by one degree. Um, a, a big heat transfer coefficient, H, it's under the line, so it will give us a small thermal time constant. It will make for very fast 
thermal response because heat transfer is very effective then. Um, it's useful to write the mass as density times volume and then this volume to area ratio appears in the thing. So people will often consider this the ratio of volume to surface area as the characteristic or as one of the characteristics that determines how quickly a thing will respond thermally. So let's do a, finally, let's do a quick example to put some numbers on this. Let's do a good engineering uh, trick and approximate our potato as a sphere. Um, you can look up some uh, ballpark thermophysical properties in a textbook. My textbook has an entry in its table of properties for, for, for watery foodstuffs. We'll use that as, a, as, a, as, a, as, an, as an order of magnitude anyway. Uh, we get a density that's a little bit less than water, a specific heat that's about, uh, I don't know, three quarters of the value for water. Um, we are, I've estimated a convection coefficient of uh, 8 watts per meter squared Kelvin here. How to estimate that is a whole other day's work. I'm not going to get into that uh, right now. But uh, we can crunch some numbers now. The volume is uh, 0 0.02. Uh, sorry, the volume is 268 times 10 to the minus 6 cubic meters. The surface area is about 0 0.02 square meters. Uh, we plug the numbers in to rho VC over HA. We got a time constant of uh, 91 minutes. So what does that mean? It means that if we are starting at 20 degrees C and we're tending towards 200 degrees C, it's going to follow a curve like that. Uh, in 91 minutes, we'll have gone about 63% of the way, uh, which is what? 63% of 180. It's something on the order of uh, 100 degrees C of temperature rise. Okay, Now, we don't want to go to 200 degrees Celsius when we're cooking a, a potato. It would be uh, incinerated. Uh, we want to get it to uh, maybe 60 degrees C. Uh, and you can plug the numbers in. You can work backwards there. I'm working from the equation in the red box there to figure out how long it's going to take to get to 60 degrees C. So 200 uh, minus 60 divided by 200 minus 20 is e to the minus t over tau. Uh, we have a value for tau. We can plug that in. We need to take the log of both sides then. Um, when we do that, when we take the log of this side here, uh, we are going to simply end up uh, with our minus t over tau. We can solve that for time, and we get a result of 23 minutes. So do go through that calculation for yourself and check that out.